Thank you guys. Thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Rohit and I work in advertising and more specifically I work in digital advertising. So when I say I work in digital advertising, this is probably the wrong slide to start with because it says the future is analog. So I have a pretext to the entire piece. Uh, so this, what you see here is something that I clicked somewhere in uh, New York. So I was walking in New York and I came across this one store. It's called the So I was, I was in New York and I came across this store called the Lomo store. Uh, so it's a small little store like this and then I walk across that and I see this uh, store selling a bunch of cameras out there. And these are the old school cameras, right? This is not the regular camera. So I walk in and I find a bunch of these really cool looking old cameras that need this film in it. And that got me intrigued. So as I was walking there, there was this big hoarding which said the future is analog. And that word kind of stuck to me. So when I was called in here for the TED event and you guys told me the topic is back to basics, I think this kind of tied in. So I brought the entire aspect here. Now, when I'm explaining about the Lomo piece, I think I should get further in detail to you. So what the Lomo camera actually looks like, this is what it actually looks like. And there's actual history to what the camera is. So back in 1982, uh, 1981, the Japanese first invented the small camera that anybody could use. So it's that small little Konica kind of a camera that people were taking around. They were taking photographs with that and that got really popular. Now the Russians obviously couldn't stand that. They said that we need to do something about this. So how can only the Japanese have something cool and why not us? So they decided to go into research to figure out what can we do with uh, building a whole new camera in that space. And Lomo was a company that was primarily working with building lenses. So they used to build lenses for microscopes. So they got down to research and this guy called Panfilov, he's the uh, person behind the Lomo camera. He decided he he looked at the Konica, he looked at the Lomo, and he looked at everything else and said, what do we do? What can we, how can we do something to make it better? So the idea was the other cameras were really heavy, so let's make a lighter camera. So instead of the steel body that you see, they replace the entire steel body with plastic. So by using plastic, it becomes lighter is the whole idea. Now in that attempt to replace everything with plastic, they also managed to replace the lens that you see with plastic. So that was not done by Intel, it was a mistake on their part. But when they came out with the first batch of the cameras, you know what happens with a plastic lens, right? Light goes in, it kind of diffuses a little, as opposed to a glass lens. So all the photographs taken by the Lomo camera had this kind of an effect happening to it. And while it was a mistake, it, the mistake kind of worked, because a lot of, it became a whole cult movement, because people suddenly started seeing, oh, my camera can now have filters in it. So people started experimenting with their cameras. And all these photos that you see are actually photographs taken straight by the Lomo camera and then washed clear up. So this kind of created a whole new movement and the movement was called Lomography. This is back in 1982 and that's the big movement called Lomography started. It's still on, a lot of people have it. But in today's day and age, we call the same thing Instagram. <laughs> and that's exactly what my whole uh, topic was all about. The future is actually analog and if you look at it, while with Instagram, we click a picture, add 10 filters to it, and put it up, the idea may have originally generated somewhere there. So while we have the convenience of the future, the past is where the main idea lies. Now, I want to show you a couple more examples on that front. Uh, how many of you remember this? Remember these small little chits in school and college we had, where one guy sitting in that end would write, score kya hua? and pass it along to the other guy, and the other guy would check and send that chit back. If you realize, that was the first peer-to-peer -peer network that was ever made. <laughs> we call that WhatsApp today, but at some point in time, that's also a part of a P2P network. Or remember those chits that you would pass on to that one best friend of yours and say, after you finish reading, just destroy it? That's a $19 billion company called Snapchat. <laughs> so if you look back, it's actually the future is actually analog on that front. So another big example is, remember hieroglyphics, which all the Egyptians, uh, they've carved in their entire walls of uh, spaces. Today, we call that emoticons. <laughs> so if you look at it, it's, and that's the clear cut point I'm trying to make, saying that if today where we stand and where, as I, 
uh, as we see things, it's all got a, uh, a small aspect of it in the past somewhere. And that's something that we should really look at. Because uh, I, I meet a lot of these young entrepreneurs and I'm, when I go to these colleges and stuff, I meet all these young guys, everybody's looking for that next big digital idea. They're all looking, saying, oh, I want to make the next big app, I want to make the next big platform. The point is you're all looking to make what it is. If you took one step back and looked behind, maybe the idea was actually right next to you there. So where, how do you take something that was behind and make this? And that's where the entire chat is actually about. So this is a quote by Dalai Lama, which said, know the rules well so that you can break them effectively. A modern rendition in today's day and age, or today's economy would be embrace the analog to probably go ahead and invent the future. And that's, that's exactly where I'm standing at. So now, uh, because I work in advertising and primarily in digital advertising, we tend to end up working every day with a bunch of brands. And I need to keep working, my entire team needs to keep working to developing newer ideas every day. So if you look back to sell a bag of chips or to sell a packet of Pepsi, uh, a bottle of Pepsi or some lipstick or anything, we have to come up with a new idea. And there is no new idea. We have to go back and say, okay, what is what, what really happened? What do we bring that into here? One example from my entire life that I bring by is, uh, it's the story of our website actually. And it's, it's strange because when I came here, a lot of people actually came to me and said, oh, we love your website and it's fantastic and we love the way it's coded, etc. And it's actually, I mean, I don't know how many of you have seen it, but if you go there, the website's actually, it's one flow of sorts. It's a video of sorts that flows there. Now, what is the inspiration behind that website? If I tell you this, it's going to be a little shocking because Back when I was a kid, around when we were about six years old, there used to be a chewing gum called Big Fun. And if you exchanged 20 wrappers of Big Fun, you got something called a Flickr book. A small little book, where if you, if you just turn the pages really fast, you would see uh, a couple day come and throw a bowl of delivery. Or you would see Imran Khan bat. And th those are really exciting things. So the first time ever, we actually came across something like a live GIF. We said, can we integrate that into a live scenario online and that's where this entire thing came from so that's exactly where the glitch website was so like i was saying this is it was an analog inspiration that somewhere gave birth to a future rendition and that's that's exactly where we want to be in the future so now in the talk now i've been giving you a bunch of ideas and i've been giving you a lot of inspirational pieces that we spoke about i'll I just want to actually turn around and say, okay, how do we, if I'm saying embrace the analog to invent the future, what do I really mean by embrace the analog in that way? So in, because I work in the creative aspect, I'm going to share with you how I went analog to get a little more creative every day. So that's primarily where my actual topic of the chat is. So the entire piece that I spoke of right now is probably the premise that's, that led to this. Uh, because I'm talking to a large bunch of engineers here. I thought the best way to talk is in your lingo. So I've got a small little algorithm put together. And this is what I call the creative algorithm. It's called WDPR. And that's the algo I generally follow and to get a little more creative. And I, I think if a few of you could actually try and adapt this to yourself, and maybe that works there. So what is WDPR? So W stands for right. We as human beings have forgotten to put pen to paper now. In today's day and age, we are so used to typing messages, to uh, taking notes on your phone and things like that. We've forgotten to put pen to paper. And you know what? It, it's strange that I'm saying this because I also sometimes end up taking my notes on the iPad or the other thing, and even right now. But it's important to actually put pen to paper because the minute I put the key points in there, it all works. So. The clear-cut rendition my grandma once told me at some point in time, and when I was a kid, that, listen, if you want to learn something, write it down and you'll learn. I thought it was rubbish. I never believed her. But today when I look back, maybe she made a lot of sense at that point in time. So the, the reason being, nothing can work as fast as your brain can, right? And there is no device that can capture the brain as fast as your own hand can. So when I put the pen to paper and say when people are talking about it, my brain automatically decides where to go, decides to tell me what are the key points that I need to note about. And those are the notes I put in. At the end of that entire thing, when you're trying to solve something, you look down and say, okay, 
this is what it was and then suddenly the answer is right in front of you. So putting that pen to paper always helps and it's so important that people do this but very rarely do I see people putting pen to paper these days and I've actually made it a habit to put, put pen to paper so write is one of the key parts of my uh, go on there. The second aspect is draw. How many of you can draw here? If I ask that question. Okay, that's like 20%, 30% of this. What if I told you everybody can draw? I'm not saying everybody is an artist, but everybody can draw. If you can put a pen to paper, you can obviously draw. How good you are may differ, but you can all draw. And you know what? How important drawing is because uh, drawing or sketching on that front is is because when you're sketching, you're actually sketching an emotion. Uh, a photograph captures the moment, a sketch captures the emotion because you're sketching exactly what you think is important in that scenario and you put emphasis to that. So maybe if I take a photo today and I leave it on my computer and maybe 10 years later look back at that photo, it's a good photograph but I'll never remember what made me click that photo. But if I made a sketch, you've actually emphasized on the piece that you're doing and that's the key part. So when I came to draw, if I were to if, some, if we ask somebody to interpret this as a drawing, there's somebody who would have artistically drawn it this way, or somebody who would have just made it this way. But end of the day, it's how that person saw it. And it's so important to know it that way. So I always end up, so when I've written something down that I was talking about earlier, the right piece, the minute I finish writing, I actually try and draw what I had written, because it kind of stays with you, and it savors the entire emotion around it. And it's not just me who's saying this, have you met uh, Martin Scorsese? So Martin Scorsese, when he's directing a film, he's, after he writes his entire film down, he, write, he goes ahead and makes his own storyboard. He draws his own storyboard because he wants to tell the story the way he wants to. So he's going to draw it the way he's seeing it as he wrote it. And you know how well he can draw? This is how his drawings look. I'm not joking, this is a Martin Scorsese storyboard. The, and it's, it's as simple as that, you don't need to really know, you don't need to be an artist here, but the importance of drawing is so important uh, for you to inculcate or take that moment in is absolutely important. So that's my second part of the algorithm. The third part is play. And I think as we grew up, we've all forgotten to play. And we've all forgotten the importance of play in our lives. By playing, the, it kind of unleashes a certain kind of imagination. And that, as kids, remember when you used to play with G.I. Joes and Hot Wheels and stuff, and you would make your own story around this. You've forgotten that today in today's day and age because we are so busy working and doing other kind of things. As we grow up, we forget to play. And this happened recently. I walked into uh, Hamley's a toy store. I picked up a few toys and went to the billing counter. And the lady there gave me a dirty look like, is this for you? And I'm like, why can't it be for me? I actually make it a point to play, uh, to spend at least five to 10 minutes every day with a few toys that are on, always on my desk. It could be a Lego, it could be some clay, but it's so important that as you play with it, it kind of gives you ideas. So when you're playing with a Lego, you, so you think of something, an idea comes through, you write it down, the idea fleshes out, and the minute you write it down, you then try and sketch it, it works. So my actual algorithm comes down to the entire piece there, which is, it all repeats itself there. So I write, I draw, I play, and I repeat. So write, draw, play, repeat. And this is my creative algorithm that's there. Now, if I step back on the entire piece, and I look at it, when I was six years old, I used to maintain a journal. I used to draw on the walls of my house. And I used to play with Hot Wheels about all those stories that I was making up. That time, probably, I didn't have the algorithm there, but I still did it. Today, I've put a science to it to bring that algorithm, which brings me to the, f the first point I actually made, which is the future is actually analog. It was the analog thing that I was thinking of, which gave me the future to doing what it is. Thank you.